Spent most of my life down here in the smoke. Scraping by on the half pence, as they say. Bloke can get so as barely living. It's just right as the burning rain. Or he gets together with his mates to make something more. Few of us do the odds and ends, plucking what we can from those what come slumming our way. Call a chum a rat bag all you likes, but our worlds ain't meant for mixing. When the worlds of the uppers and the lowers cross too often, well, things tend to go missing. Or they just get real ugly. So, uh, so we bring you guys up, and it is, uh, it's evening in London. Uh, you guys are in the, uh, the area of Bloomsbury, which holds not only, uh, the place of the Queen's birth, but also the British Museum. Just down the street, and over to the right, there's Great Russell Street, and on that corner there's the Museum Tavern. Within that tavern, a comfortable table serves as the gathering spot for all of you. Uh, one of you holds a token, like a wood disc with the torchbearer symbol, the compass, uh, the compass rose, burned into the face of it. And this is the emblem by which you gain entrance to the private room in the back of the tavern. So uh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, who would actually have the. Uh, have the, uh, the token at this point. Okay. Well, we uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think it would be my character, the lieutenant, would probably have it as the upper class member of the group. All right. So, how did you uh, how did you come about that uh, come about that token? Well, it's uh, been passed down uh, from. Uh, an officer in the military who had actually served underneath my, my grandfather in the Napoleonic Wars, he passed it on to me and said that it was intended for me from my grandfather. Uh, but I, for a long time, I didn't know what it was for. I just kind of sat in my, you know, locker collecting dust. Right. Right. Okay. So, uh, so as we kind of go around the table, mm -hmm. um, we've got, uh, we've got the four of you, uh, one of whom is missing, uh, the fifth member of the group, uh, Monsieur Joyot has uh, been called away on a, a meeting of no little consequence. Uh, one, of her, one, of his, um, one of his clients uh, for the, his particular business has uh, requested his services. So off he goes to make, uh, make some money for his profession. And he also did leave a subtle, uh, subtle hint that he's also there to gather some information for you all. So um, the reason for your gathering tonight at the tavern is uh, a message from Sir Winston Clarkson, the uh, benevolent benefactor of the Torchbearer Society, or one of four in the, uh, in the place. And uh, this tavern, being that it is relatively close to the British Museum, serves as a point of entry for you to the, the lower room beneath what's called the reading room. It's a new gigantic library that was just constructed about a year and a half ago and w underneath that library is your base of operations for the torchbearer society so it's uh, probably about six or seven o'clock at night uh, the sun's just uh well, about seven o'clock the sun's just gone down uh, so the crowd is starting to gather a little bit more at the uh, at the museum tavern so what uh, what do you guys uh, what do you guys chat about now? You guys have had six months under your belt as far as endeavors for the society. Um, one of which was to bring back an important book that uh, was the impetus for your original meeting at <laughs> Love Fun's Noodle House. <laughs> so uh, the the mission was successful, and we can obviously reveal a little bit more of that as we get into the the uh, the scenes going forward. But um, how are things going right now? It's been six months. How do you guys get along at this point? 
Um, Miranda has some affinity for Dove. Uh, I think the two of them have, have made a good connection that's turning in, I would think, turning into a friendship. Oh, yeah. Mm. Um, she's uh, st- still very reserved, but uh, the two of them seem to have struck it off uh, on a much better footing. Uh, Dr. Loom, she's still a little leery around him. <laughs> <laughs> His brash, you know, kind of grumpy personality is a little intimidating and, and uh, doesn't necessarily make her want to open up very much. Um, but the lieutenant seems to be just, you know, they seem to get along well, just not particularly have any any um, close friendship or affinity at this point. Gotcha. Okay. Who wants to go next? Oh, I, I would agree that... Uh... Dove is awful fond of Miss Russell, uh, mostly for two reasons. You know, being foreign-born, uh, because it that generally leads to not good times in the middle of London. So, and th- then top that off with the fact that she speaks Russian. Mm-hmm. So the fact that he can converse with her in his mother tongue, that's automatically good points right there. Right. Dr. Lum, he he doesn't dislike the doctor. <laughs> I feel like that's going to be the theme of the game. I don't dislike Dr. Lum. <laughs> it's what happened to like him. a cantankerous sucker. That's uh, right. He doesn't dislike him, but he has, he has no, you know, as we were joking even before we recorded this session, but especially with the noodle incident, he has no problem throwing him around mm-hmm. and generally disregarding him. Um... <laughs> The lieutenant, I, I think Dove would actually be. I think Dove, if anybody, if he has a problem with anyone, it will be the lieutenant, simply because he's noble. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Uh, Dove does not have. He he requires that noblemen actually like earn his favor. Like Sotheby, his his patron is like the only noble that he gives outright respect to. Because of the fact yeah. that, because of the fact that he, on the norm, will be treated poorly by people of upper birth because of the fact that he is beast man. Mm-hmm. So he will he automatically kind of bears a grudge against noblemen for he that. Bears a grudge. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think. It's it's not something that can't be overcome, but I think he hasn't. I mean, we're only dealing with six months after we all got together. I don't think we've crossed that threshold yet. Yeah. Right. So if I can toss it to Lieutenant Blackwell, how do you how do you kind of respond to that? Is that is that kind of I, equal on your side? I think so. I think the lieutenant, for his part, is is fond with everyone at this point, but he doesn't really show it that well. You know, he, he kind of keeps his emotions in check, but he is kind of fond of them through their shared experiences. I would say Dov, probably he's a little bit more hands off with them just because he's a, he's a beast man and he's Russian born, you know, and, and because of uh, my character's experiences in the Crimean Wars, he's just still kind of distant, but he, he's building trust there. Uh, I think he has a lot of respect for Dr. Loom. You know, he, he can't stand him, but he has respect for the guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because he knows where he stands with him, you know, and, Dr. Loom is pretty upfront with that. And Miranda, I think he he's has a, you know, like a soft spot in his heart for her, you know. So, you know, gotcha. I think he something there that he, he really likes about her. Okay. Got it. Got it. <clears throat> all right. Well, Dr. Loom, what do you think? <laughs> he hates all of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm this hatred Barely for everyone. Tired. I do not necessarily hate you, sir. <laughs> I have learned over the last six months that there are times when one has to associate with their mental inferiors. For <laughs> if I do not condescend to do so, I will only have the occasion to accompany other human beings once every 12 months. <laughs> so I feel that I have very much mellowed over this time, and I have learned to work together in a team, and I have put up with your many deficiencies over this time, and I find you all not entirely despicable. <laughs> 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 so perfect so perfect uh, uh, and we, we all kind of just glossed over i mean granted he's not here right now uh dove just kind of chuckles at joyo he really he he he's does not buy anything that man sells <laughs> but, <laughs> but 
but he's so delightfully charming in the way he does it that Dove can't help but chuckle. <laughs> nice, nice. Oh my goodness. So, uh, good. So you guys are sharing a pint, um, or whatever you guys. What What do you guys choose to drink? Like, if you were gonna be at a tavern, what would you drink? That's Dark a good dwarven question. beer. Dark dwarven beer. All right. <laughs> Dove, are you gonna go with the traditional vodka? Uh, yeah, I think Dove, he, he isn't like super fond of Motherland, uh, because he, you know, he he had nothing but miserable memories of that place, but I think there is some things that stuck with him. And, uh, I do think that, I do think that he'll have a fondness for it, but not like as much as you'd think. I do think that he'd prefer a, a dark ale, like something heavy, something that, you know, Sits in the gut. Nice. <laughs> How about you, Lieutenant Blackwell? What would you prefer? Uh, I think the Lieutenant would go with a fine wine. He's, he's uh, uh, you know, connoisseur of all things high class. So. Okay. Or at least he tries to be. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that'll work out here in this particular neighborhood. You'll probably get access to both. All right. And then uh, how about you, Dr. Loom? You said dwarf. Still Dr. Still dark dwarven beer. That's it's one right. of the few things upon which the bear and I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike the red juice of the lieutenant. <laughs> For man or bear or dwarf. Or dwarf. <laughs> Oh, nice. Miranda would probably have be going for. I mean, if she can't drink tea, she'd probably drink a wine. Okay, so you'll probably get wine. They probably won't have tea here. Yeah, exactly. Um, at least not at this, this time. The Earlier they would have. Which I have. One of the many deficiencies which I have learned to overlook. <laughs> <laughs> you can't trust anyone who can't drink. Um, all right, cool. So, yeah, the, you know, and that brings up an interesting point too: is that in this particular neighborhood, this tavern serves as kind of a nexus point for various sections of society um it doesn't normally cater anything lower than middle class of which dove is uh, a member of even though he is a, a bearman but there is the kind of general understanding to avoid trouble in the bar or in the tavern that when you guys do come in that you usually take the table in the back um so and that's where you guys find yourselves at this time where you're waiting. And about a half hour passes by as you guys get back together. Uh, maybe you haven't seen each other in a couple weeks, that sort of thing. So you're sharing some stories. And uh, one of the um, one of the barkeeps comes by. He's a, uh, a balding uh, gentleman with uh, thick handlebar mustaches that come down past his chin and curl up right here. Um, comes over and uh, says, all right. You two, uh, you you got your uh, you got your doorway open back here, if you if you're ready to go. Okay. <laughs> yes, ready to go. Let's do it. <laughs> so he uh, he says, "All right, follow me," and so he uh, he leads you back. And by the time everybody stands up, I mean you know that this guy, his name is Simmons, and he uh, he's not a very tall man, but he's human. I uh, got a big old belly. That was big old hand of our mustaches with the balding hair, and uh, um, he usually wears a bowler hat, but at this time he's not. Uh, so he takes you guys into the rear part of the tavern, and uh, there's a narrow doorway that leads back. And <laughs> as you guys are uh, you're winding a path through a narrow hallway, passing a back room where there's a couple of snooker tables that are available. Um, and as you pass by the open doorway, you see a few gents that are there, um, you know, with their uh, with their hats and their uh, their suits, and just sitting there enjoying a friendly game. Uh, but every, it seems as you guys pass by, they all look up at once, but then they see who you are, and then they turn back and they uh, go back to their gaming. Um, but the uh, the hallway leads back to a single room, an eight by eight where several casks are stored along one side of the wall in racks, or wooden racks. So what does the, uh, I'll have any of you guys fill this in here, what does the sequence look like that gains you entrance to, I don't know, would it be a, uh, a basement door, like a trap door, or would it be a secret panel door that gets you entrance? What would you guys I, I Oh. 
<laughs> I, uh, I almost wanted to have something to do with the little wooden thing Sigil, yeah. that, that the lieutenant has. Like, you plug it into the wall and turn it. Yeah. Okay, cool. That, or if there's a pattern of some sort on the sigil that we could use you know, to match that pattern on something on the wall. Right, kind of like a keyhole. Uh -huh. All right, cool. So, Lieutenant Black Blackwell, I assume that you uh, step forward. And so, what does that look like when you uh, when you go and you find this little keyhole and match up the pattern? Uh, I put I put the uh, sigil into the hole, and you see the outline of the door form and start to creak open a little bit. All right, cool. <clears throat> does it slide, or do you have to push it inwards? Uh, you have to push it in a little bit. All right, cool. All right, so the doorway opens, and um, you're presented with another 8x8 room, almost a mirror reflection of this one, but it's free of any uh, any racks or anything. It's uh, stones, uh, stone floor, stone walls that match, again, match the room that you were just in. But at the back part of this area, there is a spiral staircase that leads downward, and that's, uh, that is your connection to the lower areas of the city. Now, this particular tunnel was uh, created during the time of uh, uh, during the time of the construction of the reading room, and uh, Sir Winston Clarkson knew that the types of associates that he would be drawing forward would not always be human. They would not always be eldren. They would not always be high high caste, or they would be uh, possibly middle class. But in order to make sure that people could still gain access, or the society could gain access to their headquarters, this room was developed, and this pathway was developed. So, you guys descend a spiral staircase that leads down um, into the darkness, and as you uh, as you get down to the last step, there's a pressure plate that you step onto, and it starts. You start hearing the hiss and and uh, clack of uh, steam-driven cogs, and then all of a sudden, lanterns that li light. Uh, begin to light the hallway that leads away from you and towards the east that leads to the museum. And so as you guys walk through the uh, through this uh, passageway, it's a little dank um, just because it's hard not to be in a town where it's almost always raining, so there's always moisture around, so it's not completely dry down here. And add to that the steam that comes through the pipes that's functioning the lights and, and uh, keeping this place open. Yeah, it's hard not to notice. So you uh, you travel down the passageway, and eventually you come to an opposing staircase uh, that uh, again mirrors the ones you descended on or st descended through. And this time it only goes up one flight, and this leads you into an open area um, that you know quite well at this point as the headquarters of the Torchbearer Society. Um, now. At up until this point, you guys are the only ones that you know of are part of the society outside of Sir Winston Clarkson. Do you think uh, Do you think there's been hints that there's other people involved with the society? I would say yes. Yeah. Um, but that's just I'm not wedded to that idea. <laughs> well, what do you guys think? I, I get this vibe like there are local contingents. Like we're the London team, mm -hmm. but that but there might be others elsewhere. Okay, I like that. Mm. I like that, very good. Yeah, I do too. What do you guys that think? Would, that I I actually like that a lot because that would um, well, <laughs> first of all, that would give us a, a connection in any place that we traveled to, mm -hmm. but. It also would be strange if we were the first. So, what happened to the previous Torchbearer Society in London? <laughs> yeah. Ooh, ooh, nice. That that would be something that I would be worried about. If <laughs> if we're all being brought in and there's no one else, and it's clear that this organization has been around a while, why is there no one else here? It's like a Cthulhu campaign. Your mission is always to go find the previous team that disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to get dark real quick. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I like that. What happened to the previous team? I'll have to build up some lore on that. <laughs> or I'll make you guys do it because I'm lazy like that. <laughs> no, it's not lazy. 
it's clearly <laughs> involving us in the story. That's how you have to say it. Yeah, yeah it's no, not it's not lazy GMing. It's world building. That's correct. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your support. PC participation. Mm -hmm. Re remember that when we get to our new game, and I have. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Perhaps something right. devastating happened to the Torchbearer Society as as a whole, and we're not oh. entirely certain how much of it survived. And it's kind of piecing itself Ooh, back. I like that. Back. It's interesting. Well, then you also you also got to ask how Granddad got the sigil in the first place. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's right. That's right. That's true. And did Dad have something to do with the disaster? Oh, oh that's, that's really interesting. <laughs> Ooh. I like it. Yeah. That's good. That's good stuff, man. So grandfather was the good side, and then the father. If you haven't gotten hooked through. on this yet, you should stay tuned because we're apparently building awesome here. That's right. That's Absolutely. right. As the okay. GM lays down notes furiously. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All of these things will come back to haunt. I mean, uh, help you later on. That's so for sure. Let's see. It makes a lot more sense if if the organization had been around and there was some. Whether we know that history or whether we are deliberately being kept in the dark, uh, how are we getting our missions, the ones that we've received so far? Where does that come from? Well, it's very much like this. Um, after the uh, after the restaurant um, and your guys' successful endeavor to retrieve the book of uh, Sir, Sir Winston Clarkson's design, well, not so much design, but uh, the target of his uh, his request, Mm -hmm. um, you were you were basically given messengers messengers that will come out and deliver messages to you from whatever location that you normally frequent, and the gathering point is the museum tavern, and from there that's when you gain access to the uh, to the society itself or the headquarters itself. Okay. So, so. Do the messages just tell us to show up, or do they give us? Uh, the 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 quest basically in that message. It basically it tells you to show up. Okay, so then we would be meeting with someone here mm -hmm. who would give us further information. Okay, right. cool. And normally, the way I have it kind of laid out, and it's totally open for interpretation if you guys want. Um, normally, it would be uh, Sir Clarkson that would meet you. Um, uh -huh. However, on occasion, it could be one of the other members of the society. So it could be uh, one of the, uh, um, let's see here, it could be Sidney Smirk, one of the dwarven architects for the reading room. Uh, it could be uh, uh, Antonio Panizzi, who is from uh, Pisa, who is also an architect and uh, had focused study in ancient Rome, or had some study in ancient Rome. Or study, I'm sorry, studied in, uh, studying on ancient Rome, not in ancient Rome. That would make him <laughs> a thousand years old. Um, but, uh, but yeah. So it could be any okay. one of those, or it could be, you know, it could be this highborn founder as well. It could be, you know, whether it could be the Commodore, it could be somebody else. I know we were kind of dabbling in that discussion the last time. So, okay. um, so yeah, I mean, for now, I, I mean, if you guys want to go with it being Mr. Clarkson, we can do that. Yeah, that's fine. I just want an idea of, of how many other people we might have interacted with at this point. Right, 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 right. So, okay. uh, it totally makes sense. Okay. Uh, let's see here then. Let's. Um, so you guys uh, then go up the single flight of stairs, the spiral staircase that goes up. The uh, it's kind of a combination of uh, wrought iron and uh, brass plating and stuff as you guys make your way way up. So you have the clanking of your boots and shoes as you mo you move um, into the headquarters proper. And as you walk in, uh, the place is. Uh, the place is well appointed in as much as it's warm. It feels much drier than the passageway that you came from before. Um, it has uh, nice lantern lighting that keeps it at a soft, kind of like a bright, uh, soft yellow color that um, kind of invites almost kind of like the ambiance of a hearth um, as you guys come in. And there's always the unmistakable odor of uh, Sir Winston Clarkson's cherry oak tobacco. Um, he is always a big fan of that, and it seems every single time you see him, he is either smoking a pipe or he is either filling his pipe and uh, getting ready to smoke it then. Um, and uh, as you guys walk in, um, he is at his accustomed place in this giant comfy chair, 
Um, and uh, he's got his writing desk that's at his lap that uh, basically folds out and over onto the side of the chair when it's not in use and then comes back up and then plants itself right in front of him so he can take notes and that sort of thing from uh, the comfort of his chair. Um, and he says he's got his wild, wispy white hairs coming around like a, this kind of cloud crown that's uh, about his head. Uh, he's got his bulbous nose and the glasses that kind of hang down all the way to the bottom, and you're not sure how he sees through them. Unlike it's maybe it's like a periscope or something, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. And as the as you guys step into the room, he uh, he looks up, and you see the spine of the book, and you recognize it as the the book from six months ago um, that uh, that you guys endeavored to retrieve, and. Uh, he closes it softly and then rubs the spine and then smiles and then looks up at you and he says, Ah, I will love, welcome, welcome you. I'm so glad you were able to re uh, receive my message. Um, I understand Monsieur Joyot is not going to be available, but uh, that is that is quite all right. Um, he is uh, he is on an information gathering uh, expedition as I know it. So um, welcome, welcome. How is everyone? Come in, come in. And he uh, points you to like the various chairs that are around the area. So, so what other what other accoutrement do you normally see in a place such as this? Um, you know, being that it's beneath the reading room, is it stacked chock a block with books, or is there a lot of odds and ends of statuary and that sort of thing? I would I would assume there are uh, there's at least one area of the desk with some writing implements and things to take notes and <clears throat> things of that nature. Okay. For whatever discussions we might need to have and for planning purposes. I think it would depend for me on the answer to this question. Now, in our world, the reading room is open to the public. Right. Uh -huh. In this world, do we kind of own this place or is is this like a, a – because I know you say it's under the reading room. Right, right. So Does, this room – is this room just ours? Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm asking. Is oh, yeah. this a public thing or is this just us? This is just the society. Yeah. So it's you know you know that there's like several storage levels for books and that sort of thing above your heads and then the library proper above that. So So I'm I'm expecting something like uh, I almost want to say like the Bat Cave esque. I was, where it's like I was just gonna say it's our Bat Cave. <laughs> yeah, so you get like you have like the the glass cases with things we got from other jobs that should not be in the wrong hands, like that yes. kind of stuff. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah, I view it a little bit like a, a Bond movie Q's workshop as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe a little oh, more like Leonardo that. da Vinci's workshop, but and there's just all kinds of stuff here. Definitely a, a selection of books as well, though, because we would need to be able to have some things referenced, possibly books that are related to our previous um, uh, quests that haven't been reshelved upstairs again yet, um, but books for sure. I think they'd probably think be like, like pretty rare oh, books too, rarity, you know, and, they're, not, they're not the books you'd find upstairs a lot of times. And maps, lots of maps. Mm, lots of maps. Lots of maps. Like I, I think there should be like an upper loft to this basement oh. where all the books, there's like a loft and some stairs going up and then there's just rows of books uh -huh. up there. And then down below is more of the workshop-y sort of. Okay. I like it. I like it a lot. Very cool. I'm kind of taking some notes. And of course, the benefit of having recording here, folks, is I can always go back and if I miss something, I can always jot it down. Good stuff. And you said workshop-y. I actually typed that about three seconds ago. <laughs> that's just weird you start thinking like your players then you know that you've bonded <laughs> quite well all right very cool guys very cool um let's see here all right so so yeah so you guys have come in and you're looking about the place and uh you see some of the uh materials that you your team has actually uh reacquired um, you also see materials, you know, books, that sort of thing that have been here ever since you first stepped foot into this area. Um, so could that be from previous incarnations of the Torchbearer Society in London? Or perhaps this is just from Clarkson and uh, the rest of the uh, uh, society founders, their own private collection. Who knows? Um, but, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, this is a great start. And we'll continue. You know what I think would be kind of cool is every time we come back here, we kind of flesh this out a little bit more. Like, you know, oh, there's, you know, you have that writing room and you have the loft up above where you're reading, but there's also a place over here where you can actually draw out maps. There's actually a cartographer's room, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it can be. So very cool. Nice work, you guys. All right. So the uh, uh, Sir Clarkson kind of, you know, again, he looks up and welcomes everybody here, has you guys bring out, uh, pull up some chairs, that sort of thing. So um, it has been a glorious day. I've been able to uh, um, visit with some of the curators up above, and uh, they are bringing in a new shipment of books from the East Indies. I am very keen on getting a hand at those. Um, but uh, as soon as they arrive, if, uh, if there are any choice collections that we can bring down here, I will certainly let, uh, let you know. Um, I know, Miss Russell, you are usually in, interested in such things, and uh, Dr. Loom, I do believe that there is some there that has to deal with some nature of apothecary uh, that uh, might interest you uh, with, uh, with certain uh, certain medicinal herbs and, and uh, formulas that they've been using uh, f since time immemorial. So uh, it could be... I know it is your manner, sir, to jam-pack at least three minutes of information into a 60-minute meeting, but perhaps we could do all of these and you could provide me with a list of titles. <laughs> I certainly shall. Um, as soon as those, the, the list comes available, whew, <laughs> yes, <laughs> he, like, he pulls out a handkerchief, as he's wont to do when, uh, when Dr. Loom uh, uh, utters his words. He's like, oh my, yes. Um, so um, the reason that I bring you here is that I have received contact from someone, um, a friend of ours, um, but at least a friend of the museum, I should say, a miss, Mrs. Henry Doyle. Um, has requested the, um, how shall I say it, has requested the uh, audience with capable individuals um, that uh, our group can potentially provide. Um, it has not gone unnoticed by some of the uh, people who interested in our work, of the successes that you've had in, shall we say, reclamation. So um, it is along those topic lines that she has requested the audience. Um, uh, Mrs. Henry Doyle, her, her, her given name is Patricia, but uh, she is uh, married to a Mr. Henry Doyle, who is a businessman uh, who is uh, quite successful in import-export, but uh, also provides the occasional donation of books, cultural pieces, and money um, to the library uh, to the reading room above and to the British Museum at large. Um, and uh, it is as a favor uh, to that family that uh, I would like to engage your services in finding out what it is that is vexing her. Uh, has, does, what was her name, Miss, Miss Henry uh, what? Mrs. Henry Doyle. Um, her, Henry. her first name is Patricia, but obviously... Uh, with the, so, uh, Sir Winston, does Miss Henry Doyle uh, understand who will be visiting her, or is she expecting someone of appropriate rank, or are we okay to go <laughs> as we are? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I will put it this way, that the audience has been sought um, in none but um, about two hours, two and a half hours. So it would be nighttime that you would be arriving. Uh, and it is in Kensington, uh, just um, just that way. And uh, for those in, those understanding, Kensington is uh, not entirely super wealthy, but is in the well-to-do area where police presence okay. is frequent. But um, they know to stay out of the business of the upper class uh, just as much as they know to protect them. But um, that's a good good lead off question, and he, uh, Sir Winston, kind of looks back and forth and to the others to see if there might be other questions involved. I think so at this time. Okay. All right. Um, There's yeah. no further information as to the nature of her problems. Well, she, I, I should say that. The word was given to her about the ability of our group to find things. So I would imagine that it is something that has gone lost from her possession uh, that uh, that we would need to reacquire. 
And so she... the answer is no. You have no further information. <laughs> she is um, a friend of the museum, so I mean, yes, she yes, has. Yes, yes, yes. Quite, quite, quite a, a friend of the museum. Yes, um, and I, I do, I do tend to want to respect her, her privacy. That, that is. Uh, uh, that of course goes without saying, Doctor Loom. I I respect your privacy. I I would do the same um, for any any of you, uh, of course. Um, <clears throat> oh my. Um, so um, uh, any any other inquiries or questions, um, I can uh, provide you with instructions on the uh, directions to her place, uh, address, that sort of thing. Does Mr. Doyle know that we will be calling upon his wife? Ah, oh my, yes. <laughs> I am so glad that you did mention this. Um, uh, Mr. Doyle uh, does not appear to know. He is actually out of town uh, at the moment. Um, oh. Not to be returning for, I believe, two days. Uh, this request actually comes from Mrs. Henry Doyle directly. Oh my, I'm so glad okay. you mentioned that. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, any instructions on possibly entering or, or knocking on the servant's door or um, anything specific that we should do at her request to draw less attention to ourselves? Uh, yes, there, there is a pathway that you can take that will uh, take you to the servant's quarters, yes. Um, she lives on a... it's. Yeah, long lock. It's um, uh, these homes are uh, close together, so it is not su such that it is an estate of some kind. It is uh, you actually. Uh, there are adjoining homes, so yes, there is a servant's okay. entrance. Yes, yes. Sorry. Yes, yes. He like looks over nervously at Doctor Loom as he realizes he's over-explaining the situation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for a simple yes or no. We'll do. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Ever since he mentioned. Uh, Keeping privacy, Dr. Loom has remained silent. Ah, okay, okay. interesting. All right. uh, my good Mr. Winston, that those are all of my questions. I am ready to embark whenever the rest of our group is ready to go. All right. So he looks to the others. Uh, Dove, uh, Lieutenant Blackwell? No. Good to go. All right. Dove? Nothing says good times like being in a strange neighborhood, calling on a woman when her husband is out of town. Exactly. I'm sure nothing nothing bad will happen to her in that situation. I'm sure. Miranda raises an eyebrow at Dove. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Well, um, uh, very good then. Uh, so he, he takes out a parcel of paper from within his coat pocket and hands it over. So when he hands this over to the group, who is naturally inclined to lean forward and take it? Lieutenant. Yeah, it's probably the lieutenant. All right, so he he hands it out, and he always kind of has this way of putting it out in the middle of the group. To, it's almost kind of like he's doing an experiment, like a social experiment, to see who is continuously the one that steps forward. Yeah. But uh, okay, Russell would not be the one stepping forward. <laughs> yeah. Nate's realizing what happens when you roll the upper class. <laughs> 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 that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So. All right, cool. Well, then uh, let's do this. Let's uh, let's go ahead and go to our first break, um, right. and we will pick up with uh, travel to our destination next episode. So, folks, uh, stay tuned. Uh, this will probably be releasing in the same week as the next episode, so don't worry. You won't have a huge cliffhanger. Uh, we'll be launching right into it. So we'll see you guys on the flip side. <laughs>